little bit. If you know, if you want to see the longer version, you can go back to MGTOW and culture in an earlier video. But what culture actually is, is a mechanism to fulfill human needs and potentials. So when we started at the, when we started at the base, when we were first uh, came out as animals, we satisfied our animal needs, food, food and water, food, water and shelter. Then as, as we developed and we moved up the chain, we got into things like uh, safety for the group, security and as we grew as we grew and we developed we developed social you know uh, social instruments or cultural instruments to satisfy our social needs so on and so forth marriage family the village cities whatever what have you and then as we as you can see we, as we go up higher and higher we get into what the what the intellectual needs. Here's another chart talking about, you know, breaking down the same thing we just saw in Maslow's with different categories. Like I said, if you want to break down these categories, you want to know more, go back to an earlier video. Now, we've you know, we've established that culture is an instrument to satisfy human potentialities or human needs. And that culture acts as a insulator or a buffer zone between us human beings and the natural world or our natural environment or our physical reality. Like human beings, you know, like the human beings through culture, modify or affect its natural environment by, you know, building houses, cutting down forests, killing animals, uh, draining swamps, you know, that kind of thing. By the same token, your natural environment affects your culture. And your culture affects human beings because it's a social heritage that's passed down from one person to another. So it's almost a feedback loop. Here's a, a diagram for you evolutionary biologists or pseudo evolutionary biologists like Stardust and Barbar. This is the feedback loop. Where evolution, which is the ad adaptation to your natural environment, affects genes. Now, this genes, which uh, quickly cause human potentialities, added to culture or the experiences or learned experiences from other human beings or other human personalities. Develops an actual human personality, which is the current organism. Now, the current organism and the current situation or current physical environment add together to cause a behavior. Now, this behavior is the feedback loop. It affects the evolution and how the genes express themselves over a long period of time. But this is how the loop works. All right, you squares, we're back for part two. Hopefully we can go through the whole book. Um, there's something I want to introduce about culture and biology, but I'm not going to introduce it on this one. 
I'll introduce it uh, before part three to give you an overview of where I'm coming from. Like my uh, beloved professor used to tell me, uh, Brother Didisi, he had to bring books to the book, but not today. Replacing a mate. So that all, not all mates gained can be retained, nor should they be. He says sometimes there are compelling reasons to get rid of a mate, such as when a mate stops providing support, withdraws sex, or becomes physically or psychologically abusive. He says uh, those who remain with a mate through economic hardship, sexual infidelity, and cruelty may win our admiration for their loyalty today. But staying with a bad mate generally would not have helped ancestral humans to survive and reproduce successfully. That's bullshit. We are the descendants of those who knew when to cut their losses. That's not true. Uh, they have that in rec you know they re keep records of what of what happens. Basically, divorce was not really. In most societies, divorce is not really an option because most marriages, most marriages are arranged in ancient history. Most marriages are arranged. You go back to, uh, like I said, Jarawa tribe of um, the, the Andes Islands. That culture goes back a hundred thousand years. They pair bond, but the marriages are arranged by the society, and it literally is death to us part. So. Ejecting a mate has historically been difficult. Now, in advanced societies, like uh, the toward the end of Rome, hell, now in the United, you know, now in the the post-industrial societies around the world, it's considerably easier. It's actually the divorces are actually higher. But uh, historically, now that's what I'm saying. This is historical bullshit. They're actually projecting um, modern feminist thought onto. Uh, history. This is not true. Right here. This is bullshit. If you look at the divorce rates before 1970, um, divorces were less than 10%. So 90% of people that got married, 90% of people married, and 90% of people actually stayed with their mate through uh, infidelity and and violence it's very difficult to get a divorce see so even though he talked about the ring doves and the divorce rate of 25% every season that's that doesn't that doesn't project onto um, a human society just as we have evolved sexual strategies to select, attract, and keep a good mate, we also have evolved strategy for jettisoning a bad mate. Divorce occurs in all known human cultures. That is true, but not at the rate that it is today. A divorce rate of less than less than two percent is a lot different than a fifty percent divorce rate that we're doing now. It's a completely different thing. It says, we assess whether the costs inflicted by a mate outweigh the benefits provided. We size up other potential partners, evaluate whether they might offer more than our current mate. We gauge the likelihood of su successfully attracting more desirable partners. We calculate the potential damage that might, that might be caused by ourselves, our children, our kin, by the breakup. When we combine all this with information in a decision to stay or leave. See, I see all this. All this stuff is um, modern psychology mapped onto ancient psychology. It's a lot of this stuff is actually bullshit. Yeah, most mammals are not humans. Like most mammals, humans typically do not mate with a single person for an entire lifetime. That is, and that, that, the, that's modern humans. 
This is modern humans. Humans often re-enter the mating market and, and repeat the cycle of selection, attraction, and retention. That's not true. This is modern humans. Because uh, this is, and this is before birth control. You couldn't just, um, for the most part, black people are really the only people that could actually do that. For the most part, uh, most modern humans, you have kids and property and stuff like that. Society doesn't allow you to re eject mates like that. But black people, because they were unregulated, did a lot of, did some of that stuff. But white women, no. Most women, no. You look at the Asians, their divorce rate now is like 7%. Not, not 1%. Their divorce rate is like 1%. So society basically says you mate for life. Because children from previous unions are usually seen as burdens rather than benefits when it comes to mating. A woman's ability to attract a desirable mate often suffers more than a man's. That's true. Consequently, fewer divorced women than men remarry, and this disparity gets larger with increasing age. This book documents the changes, patterns of human mating over a lifetime. All right. Conflict between the sexes. So we got marked down. Sexual strategy that one sex pursues to select, attract, to keep, or replace mate often have the unfortunate consequence of creating conflict with some members of the other sex. Among the scorpion fly, a, few, a female refuses to copulate with a courting male unless he brings her a substantial nuptial gift based on a dead insect to be eaten. So one thing about using biological parallels, sometimes they map, sometimes they don't. But you can base just about any strategy, almost any strategy, can be mapped onto uh, a particular species. Almost any strategy. Basically, it, there, there's nothing new under the sun. So what we do, there is some biological entity that actually does the same thing. Okay, not exactly, but similar. And you, if you look hard enough, you can find one. But this is mate retention. Men and women also clash over resources and sexual access. The evolutionary psychology of human mating, the sexual strategy adopted by one sex can trip up in conflict with sexual strategy adopted by the other sex. I call this phenomenon strategic interference. Consider the differences in men's and women's proclivities to seek casual short-term sex. That's very true. Men and women typically differ in how long and how well they need to know someone before they consent to have sex. Sort of. Although there are many exceptions in individual differences. Let me see, see there you go. Although there are many exceptions in individual differences, Men generally have a lower threshold for engaging in sex. That's true, because they don't get pregnant. That is, is that's all it is, and it didn't. The, only, the reason that we have uh, more women willing to engage in um, loose sex is because the lack of uh, fear of getting pregnant. There is a fundamental conflict between those different sexual strategies. Men cannot fulfill their short-term wishes without simultaneously interfering with a woman's long-term goals. And vice versa. An insistence on immediate sex interferes with the goal of a longer courtship. The interference is reciprocal, since any delay also obstructs the goal of those seeking short-term sex. That's, that's obvious. That should go without saying. Conflicts do not stop with a couple's commitment. Married women sometimes complain that their husbands are condescending, emotionally constricted, and unreliable. Married men sometimes complain that their wives are moody, overly dependent, 
and sexually withholding. Both sexes complain about infidelities ranging from mild flirtation to serious affairs. All of these conflicts become understandable in the context of our evolved mating strategies. No, that's just two people getting along. That is normal human behavior, even outside of sex. Uh, yeah, we'll do sexual orientation. Let's just read what I've highlighted. Although controversy surrounds estimates, most scientists converge to defining that roughly 96 to 97 percent of all men and 98 to 99 percent of all women have a primary orientation toward heterosexuality. Hmm. Yeah, that's debatable. But. Uh, see, for example, male sexual orientation tends to be bimodally distributed, and most men either strong are strongly heterosexual or strongly homosexual. I wonder if that's biological or that's just simply cultural, because in Greece and Rome, it was way more fluid than that. It's way more fluid than that. So I don't know if that's biological or uh, socially. Or social, social cultural. A lot of the stuff he's talking about is just social and cultural, and it differs from society to society. I don't think that's biological. But once we recognize that sexual orientation is not singular, and there are more, there are important differences between sexual attraction, sexual identity, and sexual behavior. Scientific understanding of variations in human sexuality is like to accelerate. That's like I'm so short. Culture and context. Although ancestral, ancestral selection pressures are responsible for creating the mating strategies we use today, our current conditions differ, differ from historical ones in critical ways, which is something I was saying. He doesn't say that enough through the book. Ancestral people got their fruit and vegetables from gathering and their meat from hunting. Most modern people get their food from supermarkets and restaurants. In other words... And I probably will do this. I probably will do this before the third part because it's really significant about understanding culture. Culture is not real, culture is created. And culture is created with the, the intersection or the interaction between your biology and your environment. Ancestral people had to, was hard to gather food and gather meat. Whether now in our modern uh, society, it's, it's, it's trivial because it's mechanized. So your, your adaptation, your adaptation of sexual strategies or mating strategies is going to be far different than somebody that's in the middle of a rainforest. What you look for in a mate is going to be far different than somebody in the middle of the rainforest. Not because your biology, your biology is the same. But your, but your environment is different and your cultural adaptation is going to be different. It said, nevertheless, the same sexual strategies used by our ancestors operate today with unbridled force. Now, I, don't, I disagree. Our evolved psychology of mating, after all, plays out in the modern world because it is the only mating psychology we mortals possess that's true but it plays out differently he said, well he wants to use this we have not evolved adaptations specifically for burgers or pizza but the foods we eat reveal the ancestral strategies for survival we carry with us today we consume vast quantities of fat sugar protein and salt in the form of burgers shakes fries and pies Fast food chains are popular precisely because they serve these nutritional elements in concentrated quantities. They reveal the food preferences that evolved in a past environment of scarcity. Today, however, we overconsume these elements because of our unprecedented of their unprecedented abundance. And the old survivor strategies now hurt our health. Because evolution works on a time scale too slow. See? 
because evolution works on a time scale too slow to keep up with with the radical changes of the past several hundred years we are stuck with taste preferences that evolved under different conditions that is true your taste buds are different or your taste buds are different from your mating strategies because it's far easier to overcome uh, your mating strategy with logic than it is your taste strategies because what what tastes good to you or what you desire your body desires is mostly um, unconscious so we carry with us the equipment that was designed for an ancient world in other words we'll get your dick hard our evolved mating strategies, just like our survival strategies, may now be maladaptive in some ways with respect to survival and reproduction. In other words, obsidian, that's how come the most competent male in this society, in this structure, is not always cho chosen. Women still ch women's coochie still choose a different mate. And it takes socialization to kind of override that, which is very powerful in mating strategies and see our evolved mating strategies just like our survival strategies may now be maladapted in some ways respect to this to survival and reproduction the increase in sexually transmitted infections for example renders casual sex more dangerous than it was under ancestral conditions. Yeah, because you didn't have that much casual fucking sex in ancestral conditions. You didn't have that much what? You didn't have that much ca that, that much casual sex. Duh. The, the dramatic opportunities to evaluate thousands of potential mates online sometimes paralyze our ability to decide on the one. That is, well, you have more choice you limit choices, the easier it gets, right? But the online dating hasn't been around long enough to really evaluate it, has it? Only with deep understanding of our evolved sexual strategies, their origins, and the conditions they are designed to deal with can we hope to solve the problems of mating posed by the novel these novel environments. That's true, but the thing is, the environments are changing so fast that you will it, it will be impossible to keep up. There's other stuff that I could bring in. I may bring it in as we go along. See, but the thing is, he just he's just talking about it. See, that, that's what I don't like. Why don't you put all this in at once instead of contradicting yourself? One impressive advantage humans have over many other species is a repertoire of mating strategies that is large and highly sensitive to context in other words environment consider the problem of being in an unhappy marriage and contemplating whether they get divorced the decision depends on many complex factors number one whether they allow divorce including the amount of conflict in the marriage within the marriage where the one's mate is unfaithful the pressure applied by other relatives on both sides of the family the presence of children the ages and needs of the children the prospects for attracting another mate humans have evolved psychological uh, psychological adaptations that consider and weigh the costs and benefits of these crucial crucial features of context Nope, the laws have changed to allow it. Before it wasn't allowed, now it is. It's more than context, it's environment. Cultural circumstances may also vary that are critical for activating particular sexual strategies from our complex menu of mating. Some cultures have mating systems that are polygynous allowing men to have multiple wives. Other cultures are polyandrous, allow very few are polyandrous. Other cultures have polyandrous allowing women to take uh, take two or more husbands. Still others well, are monogamous, at least on at least on the surface at least, and restrict both men and women. Restrict both women and men to marriage one marriage partner at a time.
Our evolved strategies of mating are highly sensitive to the sea. Highly sensitive to those social, legal, and cultural patterns. In polygynous mating systems, for example, parents place tremendous pressure on their sons to compete for the status and resources needed to attract women so as to avoid the matelessness that plagues some men when others monopolize multiple women. Normally, when you have a polygynous society, one, you have to be able to afford it, and two, two, there has to be a lack of males. You usually see polygyny when the number of males are low. There are very few, in modern society, very few polygynous societies. In monogamous mating cultures, in contrast, parents put less pressure on their sons. Well, because there's no need. Yeah. Another key circumstance is the ratio of sexes, or the number of available men, see, the, the number of available women in the mating pool where there is a surplus of women such as Archie and these are Paraguay or in some urban centers such as Manhattan men become more reluctant to commit to more women preferring instead of pursue many casual relationships well that's allowed that is a modern thing where there is a surplus of men such as contemporary cities of China and among the Hiwi tribe of Venezuela, monogamous marriage is the rule and divorce rates plummet. As men's sexual strategy shifts, so must women's and women's sexual strategy shift, so must men's. The two coexist in complex reciprocal relations based on the crucial sex ratio. Well, he could have studied, also studied the uh, the Russian culture after uh, World War II when a lot of uh, men got uh, obliterated and there was a severe lack of men or also Rwanda after Rwanda genocide where there was a severe lack of men a lot of men got killed you could have studied that to see how the cultural patterns actually shifted China is one thing but also India India also has an excess of men because uh, boys are preferred and they had less women We could have studied those. The, 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 mar the marriage rate in Russia didn't go down. Culture is a lot more sticky than people think it is. And I think a lot of psychologists get culture and biology all, all mixed up. They can't separate the two. In this book, you should separate the two. If I had written this, I would actually separate the two. Actually make sure that there's you explain culture versus biology. Evolutionary theory has appalled and upset people since Darwin first proposed it in 1859. People forget that um, evolution is a very, very new science. Extremely new science. It's not that old. It's not even 200 years old yet. To explain the creation of new species and adaptations that characterize their component parts. The wife of the Bishop of Worcester, his contemporary, is reported to have remarked upon hearing about theory of our descent from non-human primates let's hope it's not true if it is let's pray that it does not become generally known <laughs> let's skip down evolution and contrast occurs gradually over thousands of years of over thousands of generations in tiny increments that we cannot observe directly that is very true to understand events that occur in time on time scales this large requires a leap of the imagination in other words conjecture much like cognitive feats of physicists who theorize and infer from evidence black holes dark matter and 11 dimensional universes they cannot see so basically this is all theory that can't be proven 
um, it's probably a little easier. But since you weren't there, you didn't uh, see the incremental changes over the time. You have to look back in time. Um, you have to infer by evidence, by certain um, evidence. You had to project out. You had to project back, which is very hard. Another barrier to understanding the evolutionary psychology of human mating is ide ideological. From Spencer's theory of social Darwinism onward, biological theories have sometimes been used for terrible political ends to justify oppression or argue for racial sexual superiority. We must be vigilant about not repeating this history of misusing biological explanations of human behavior. Um, I'll do that on the before the third one. I probably should have done it right at the beginning. As a Harvard evolution, evolutionary psychologist, Steven Pinker has noted evolution, evolutionary psychology provides powerful theories to explain the aggression and cooperation as well as human sexuality and mating. Remember, they're just theories. Understanding human mating requires that we face our evolutionary heritage boldly and understand ourselves as products of those prior forces of natural and sexual selection. But the thing is, you have to balance it with culture. And said so another basis of resistance to evolutionary psychology is the naturalistic fallacy, which maintains that whatever exists should exist. The naturalistic fallacy confuses a scientific description of human behavior with a moral prescription for that behavior. In nature, however, these are diseases, plagues, parasites, infant mortality, and a host of other natural events that we try to eliminate or reduce. The fact that they do exist in nature does not imply they should exist. Matt. You know, it doesn't naturally imply it, but that is a pretty powerful motivator that if it does exist, it should exist. Similarly, male sexual jealousy, which evolved in part as an adaptation to protect men's certainty over their paternity, is known to damage women worldwide in the form of intimate partner violence. Here we go with this violence, stalking, and occasional, occasionally murder. As society, as a society, we may eventually develop method, methods for reducing male sexual jealousy and dangerous and its dangerous manifestations we already have has caused violence against women and also and, and also um, arranged marriages and social pressure actually reduces violence against women because women don't cheat the Muslims do a very good job of getting rid of jealousy. <laughs> okay, they do. It's called covering. They have a that they do have adaptations to get rid of male jealousy. The thing is, we don't want to use it because we want freedom. Okay, male jealousy, or an even female jealousy. We talk about male jealousy, but we don't talk about female jealousy. It happens on both sides. In fact, green-eyed envy is a woman's proclivity. The naturalistic fallacy applied in the reverse direction takes the form of the romantic fallacy. Some people have exalted visions of what it means to be human. According to one of these views, natural humans are at one with nature. Uh, we are. Peacefully coexisting with plants, animals, and, and each other. Uh, in balance, I don't know about peacefully. And plants and animals don't peacefully coexist with each other. War, aggression, and competition are seen as corruptions of this essentially peaceful human nature by current conditions such as patriarchy, culture, or capitalism. Those people don't know anything about nature. There is no such thing as the Garden of Eden where the plants and animals get along with each other. They all try to kill and eat each other, even down to the, uh, into the single cell organisms. Yeah, there's a very good book called The Lucifer Principle that goes through that. People, people and things eat each other. 
Despite the evidence that some people cling to these illusions, when anthropologists like Napoleon Ch Chagnon documented that 25 to 30 percent of all Yano, Yamano men die violent deaths at the hands of other Yamano men, his work was bitterly denounced by those who had presumed that the group lived in harmony. The romantic fallacies occur when we see ourselves through the lens of utopian visions of what we want people to be. But we write down about our conquest and wars, even tribal. I don't even see how that's, well, that's modern humans. They want to think that human beings can actually live in another utopia where well, they never have. They're, they're animals just like anybody, anything else. But this is uh, white liberal thinking. Opposition also rises to the presumed implications of evolutionary psychology f for change. If the mating strategy is rooted in evolutionary biology, uh, partially, some people mistakenly think that it is immutable, intractable, and unchangeable. We well, you know that's not true, or well, some people do. We are therefore doomed, according to this view, to follow the dictates of our biological mandate, like blind, unthinking robots. Well, Steven Pinker probably would think that. This belief mistakenly divides human behavior into two separate categories. One is biologically determined, and the other is environmentally determined. In fact, human action is exorbitantly a product of both, exactly what I said, but he doesn't explain that. Should have explained that at the beginning. No, normally, see, in math, these formulas would have been, this, these formulas would have been already, how can I say, already noted. They would have put this up in, in, to, at the very beginning. Every strand of DNA unfolds with a particular environmental and cultural context, with each person's life, social, and physical environments to provide input, both development and activation of evolved psychological adaptation. Every behavior is, while exception, a joint product of those me these mechanisms and their environmental influences, which is exactly what I said. I'm actually going to put up a chart. All behavior patterns can, in principle, be altered by the environmental intervention. The fact that currently we can alter some patterns and not others is a problem of knowledge and technology. Very true. Advances in knowledge bring out new possibilities for change if change is desired. Humans are extraordinarily sensitive to changes in their environment. See, this stuff, this should have been at the beginning... of the book because natural selection did not create in humans invariant instincts that manifest themselves in behavior regardless of context it produced psychological adaptations precisely to solve the problems posed by varying contexts adaptations are cultural adaptations identifying the roots of mating in evolutionary biology doesn't does not doom us to an unalterable, unalterable fate. In evolutionary terms, men and women are similar in many or most domains. They differ only in circumscribed domains they have faced currently adaptive problems over the course of human evolutionary history. Evolutionary psychology strives to illuminate the evolved mating strategies of men and women, not to prescribe what the genders could or should be, nor does it offer prescriptions for appropriate gender roles. It has no political agenda. In other words, it is not a gospel.
And we'll end it there. And the next time we'll start with what women want. So, um, till next time, folks, this is BGS out. I'll see you, Cretans, on the next one. Peace.